Thanks for the question. Uh, so we're, get, we're concluding our uh, lectures on Macbeth, and I uh, hope you had a good break. I, I am through many of your essays, but not entirely, so I'll, I'll get them back to you early next week. Uh, but we left off, <coughs> I believe we left off more or less with Macbeth um, and the banquet scene, Act 3, Scene 4 thereabouts. And ba the banquet scene in which uh, the banquet is a symbol of order and also of celebration and also of uh, fellowship and uh, of shalom in many ways. And we found that uh, the peace and the joy that would come with a banquet is something that Macbeth is incapable of enjoying. And largely because he is uh, plagued by Banquo's ghost, who keeps, and he sees the ghost, but nobody else can see the ghost, which is a funny old thing and makes us. Uh, question whether the ghost is there or if it's only there in his mind. And the same, remember early on he, when he pulled the dagger out, is this a dagger before I see before me? Well, he knows at that point that it isn't because then he, he draws the dagger and he literally, so he's able to distinguish. Now he sees banquets, Banquo's ghost sitting in one of the chairs and nobody else can see it. So it's, 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 challenging for us even reading this, but even when it's depicted by a, a, a director, when it's performed, exactly how are you going to portray this there? Do you actually stick somebody who looks like a ghost in the chair? You probably do that if it's a, if it's a, a, a cinema, like a film version. I suspect that you stick something like a ghost in there. But you might, when you portray it, just have an empty chair there and then him imagining it. But it's, and because it's reflective as much as anything of the fact that Macbeth's guilt is speaking to him. It's his conscience. Um, but it might be more than that, and I think it probably is. And uh, Shakespeare is not really tipping his hand here. He has involved supernatural agents in here, including the witches. So maybe this is uh, the ghost sitting literally there and, and he actually does speak. So I guess that speaks for that. But you can't help but think in our modern psychological era, it's his conscience speaking as much as anything. And when we come to the next scene, which I want to look at in Act 5, dealing with the effect of the uh, deed that was done back in Act 1 on Lady Macbeth, we'll see a similar sort of sense of guilt plaguing her and a sense of uh, what she was first able to totally ignore and block out uh, the moral implications of the deed now have totally overcome her and she's uh, she's gone mad and remember when we saw her at first she was cruel and ruthless and apparently without a the slightest reservation, moral reservations about, about the deed. She just simply saw, um, uh, because of her ambition, saw the, uh, the good outcomes for her and her husband if they were to murder uh, the king, right? And she argued with him that he should do it, and why is he hesitating? And, and even with respect to herself said that uh, she wanted to be unsexed so that she would feel no compassion, and she seemed to be able to do that. But now she has no ability to do that. She's been paralyzed by uh, the enormity of the deed, and we're going to, when we'll see her, she can't get the blood off her hands, can't wipe, can't wipe them clean, out damn spot and all that. Whereas Macbeth has also progressed from where he was. At first, he recognized the moral boundary that he was about to cross and he was he was uh, intensely aware of it and even after he performed the deed he was talking about the the state of his soul like right away and she said don't speak of that that will lead to madness right you don't talk about that 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 will lead to madness well she's been unable to listen to her own counsel on this and she is now dealing with something that he has already dealt with. And he's dealt with it by putting it behind him, and now he is uh, unimpeded by any uh, thing. And he just wants, 
he, he's able to be thoughtless, which he was not at first, right? She acted without thinking. It was just desire, the lust for power. That's what spoke through her at first. He was impeded by his thinking. Now it's the opposite. She can't stop thinking about what they did. And he has no moral reservations about anything. And he is just pure lust for power. So they flipped. So if you see them as, as, as uh, foils for one another, they have now reversed roles. And now he's ex exceedingly dangerous. Nothing will stand in his way. And he's murdering anybody who will get in his path. And his wife is not able to keep up that, uh, that role, which she initially envisaged for herself. So that is just interesting. This is one of the things that fascinates me about Shakespeare is the way he uses foils to explore um, different uh, aspects of an experience. Sometimes they're exact foils, so he often uses, um, in the comedies, he's often using uh, twins and stuff like that, right? But sometimes it will be uh, brothers, and uh, we'll see this when we come to King Lear. One will be the, the natural brother, and the other will be the bastard, and he's exploring both sides of that. And then there'll be the three sisters, and they have various features in there. And so he's looking at those things, and he's, he's teasing out the moral consequences and the, uh, the theological aspects of it, the relational effects, all of those things. And, and you can do that on the stage dramatically. Uh, and, and with this, Shakespeare, who's the Renaissance playwright, is teaching his audience again uh, about moral consequences. And I think that's really interesting. So this is something that you can do on stage, which you can't even do in a book, which is to uh, remember, we, um, Aristotle said that human beings love to imitate. It's one of the features of human nature. They love to imitate and they learn through imitation, in fact. And they learn from imitation of those whom they admire in particular. So, so children will imitate their parents, their actions, whether you like it or not. They're always watching and they will imitate what you've done for good or for ill. Like if you swear Nobody else is around but the kid's there, and the kid starts picking up those words. Or behaviors, little you know, patterns of the way you look, the way you turn your head, whatever, and you say, oh my goodness, that was you. Looking, you know, that's, speak to your wife, boy, she just looked, that, she had that look just like you did, but she's, and she's picked that up, so forth. Um, everyone does that, including adults. So they learn by example, and uh, Shakespeare, by portraying these things and these foils and these actors, is trying to provide moral examples. Sometimes they're negative. Right here, if you follow this path of your ambition, here's where it goes. And here is a good character, and if you follow his path, here's where that goes. And so he's a teacher, a moral teacher, and he would regard that as a duty. Uh, so. Uh, Shakespeare falls in the tradition of the uh, Sir Philip Sidney and uh, the Protestant school of, uh, of uh, dramaturgy. And it's not only Protestant, the Catholic uh, tradition of the medieval morality plays would be exactly the same. Um, so uh, let me pick it up at Act 5, Scene 1, where we uh, enter a doctor or physic a doctor would be more like a, a teacher, probably a theologian, whereas the physic would be somebody control, more like what we would call a doctor, a medical doctor, and a waiting gentlewoman. And the doctor is, they're commenting on, commenting, commenting on the degen degeneration of Lady Macbeth. So the doctor, I have two nights watched with you, but can perceive no truth in your report. When was it she last walked, gentlewoman? Since his majesty went into the field, I have seen her rise from her bed, throw her nightgown upon her, unlock her closet, take forth paper, fold it, write upon it, read it, afterwards seal it, and again return to bed. Yet all this while in a most fast sleep. Doctor, a great perturbation in nature to receive at once the benefit of sleep and do the effects of watching. In this slumbery agitation, besides her walking and other, 
and other actual performances. What at any time have you heard her say? That, sir, which I will not report after her. You may to me, says the doctor, and tis most me, you should, gentlewoman, neither to you nor anyone, having no witness to confirm my speech. So it's begging, uh, it's certainly piquing our interest. What on earth has she listened to here that she would be unwilling to report it? It, it would implicate her guilt. We already know her guilt, so that's clear. Now, note that the, the boundaries which we've seen were, have been violated, the moral transgression, one of the boundaries, the boundaries between the supernatural and the natural violated, the boundaries between king and subjects, all these boundaries violated. Now the violation is between sleep and waking. So all boundaries are being wiped out and fair is foul and foul is fair. Right? So this is about a, a play about the transgression of boundaries and the consequences of that and the good ones. We talked about just uh, before we were uh, talking about Macbeth, we talked about the dominion mandate to be fruitful and multiply and fill and subdue the earth and all that. Um, there's also, uh, so there's a calling to do work, but there's also a vocation to sleep. God creates the night and, we, and rest is a restoration. Uh, she it cannot enjoy the fruits of her labor. We've seen Macbeth in the last scene when we're talking about the banquet where there, it's a symbol of the, the messianic banquet and the shalom of God. He is disturbed by this supernatural figure, banquet's ghost, that won't allow him to enjoy the fruits of his ambition. And now Lady Macbeth, although she sleeps, can't enjoy rest. There is no rest. For either of them, the rest is disturbed. They're constantly uh, being brought down by their own transgressions. So the fact that they will not acknowledge boundaries of any sort means that now they are, that chaos has ensued. And this is part of the tragedy of uh, Macbeth is that the great man himself has invited chaos into the world and he himself is now uh, being tormented by it. But his wife will be the one that is most subject to it. And uh, so let me go carry on with this. Now Lady Macbeth enters and she has a taper. So this famous scene and the gentlewoman to the doctor, lo, you, here she comes. This is her very guise, and upon my life, fast asleep, observer, stand close. Doctor, how came she by that light? Why, it stood by her. She has light by her continually, tis her command. You see, her eyes are open, aye, but their sense are shut. How is it she does now? Look how she rubs her hands. It is a custom action with her to seem thus washing her hands. I have known her continue in this a quarter of an hour. Yet here's a spot, says Lady Macbeth. Hark, she speaks. I will set down what comes from her to satisfy my remembrance the more strongly. Out, damn spot, out, I say. One, two, why then tis time to do it. Hell is murky. Fie, my lord, fie! A soldier and a feared? What need we fear who knows it when none can call our power to a compt? Yet who would have thought the old man to have had so much blood in him? Do you mark that? Says the doctor, Lady Macbeth. The thane of Fife had a wife. Where is she now? What? Will these hands ne'er be clean? No more that, my lord, no more that. You mar all with this starting. Go to, go to. You have known what you should not. So now the doctor sends the gentlewoman away because now he has found out what she herself knew. And so he's trying to uh, shield himself from the consequences of this. So note, note how and this is part of the problem of being brought in on a grand conspiracy of some sort. As soon as you find out about it, now you are a threat to the person who is trying to cover the deed. The doctor is aware of this fact. She didn't want to tell him a second ago. Now he wants her to go away. You should not have ever heard such a thing. But he stays. Gentlemen, she has spoke what she should not. I am sure of that. Heaven knows what she has known. Lady Macbeth, 
Here's the smell of blood still. All of the perfume, perfumes of Arabia will not sweeten this little hand. Oh, 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 doctor, what a sigh is there. The heart is sorely charged. And now the gentleman, woman, I would not have such a heart in my bosom for the dignity of the whole body. Well, 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 pray God it be, sir. And then the doctor, this disease is beyond my practice. Yet I have known those which have walked in their sleep who have died holily in their beds. Lady Macbeth to herself, wash your hands, put on your nightgown, look not so pale. I tell you yet again, Banquo's buried. He cannot come out on his grave. Even so, to bed, to bed. There's knocking at the gate. Come, 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 come. Give me your hand. What's done cannot be undone. To bed, to bed, to bed. Out she goes. Will she now go to bed? Directly. And then the doctor summarizing. Foul whisperings are abroad. Unnatural deeds do breed unnatural troubles. Infected minds to their deaf pillows will discharge their secrets. More needs she, the divine, than the physician. God, God forgive us all. Look after her. Remove from her the means of all annoyance. And still keep eyes upon her. So good night. My mind she has mated and amazed my sight. I think but dare not speak. Good night, good doctor. And they separate, go separate ways. Le just one comment and then I'll come to you. Note that he talks about nature and the unnatural deeds and the unnatural troubles. Now the nature that's being referred to here and the unnaturalness is the violation of the moral natural order. There, there's a, and I said to you that in Shakespeare's age, and this is, to, Irrespective of whether the playwright, uh, Mr. Shakespeare, is a Protestant or a Catholic, they will understand that there's an objective moral order, which, if it is violated, will, will bring down all the other orders. And I talked about the di different types of orders, but that's consistent in Shakespeare's plays. He does this uh, all over the place. It's a regular pattern there when, it, when some sort of uh, natural bond, like say that between a father and a child. If that's violated, this is a transgression of a sort that will have implications elsewhere. We saw it actually in A Midsummer Night's Dream even. There was a problem between the father and the daughter on both sides, actually. And that violation in a natural uh, bond created other problems. But this one's far worse because he, uh, Macbeth uh, murders his king, his kinsman, and his guest. This is a terrible violation. Okay, so I noticed that <coughs> at the end that the doctor returns to, when he returns to speak after Lady Macbeth is gone, that he's speaking in iambic pentameter again. Yes, and before and so, not. And before not, all the conversation before that is not there. So Between he and the and gentlewoman at any rate, yes. Well, and, and even Lady Macbeth is not speaking in iambic pentameter. No, so correct. Is this an indication then of the beginning of things turning to right? Is that why he would return, the doctor would speak in that sort of, steady realignment at the beginning of the order of chaos? So first of all, good observation. And, um, and that I, I want you to note those sorts of things. Uh, so it moves, from, uh, it moves from just speech without order to ordered speech, verse. And then the question is, so again, when I did talk practical criticism, exact same thing, first thing you have to note is that there has been a pattern and a change in the pattern. The question then is why? And the answer then is up for debate. Uh, it could be for the reason you've suggested. It could be, so let's say at the outset when the doctor and the gentlewoman are talking that they're both distraught and their minds are disordered, right? So the speech reflects the disorder of their minds, the fact that they are emotionally disturbed, that they're upset about what's going on. And now, having seen all that, he has gathered his thoughts and he has a sense of, ah, now I get it. And so he goes out from there. So it, it may not be go so far as to say, now everything's orderly and he's going to carry it away. But he understands now and it's reflected in his speech. That, that would be my suggestion. But it's just a suggestion. I don't know why exactly. But you're right. He now does, does speak, speak in uh, iambic pentameter, whereas before, 
there was no such ordering in his speech, and that reflected the disordering of his thoughts. Now again, commoners regularly speak without orderly thoughts, in the sense that there's no meter to their speech. But that's a reflection of the fact that they're more moved by their passions than by reason for Shakespeare, right? So there's an ordering of the social hierarchy and it's matched in the way they speak. So when kings and queens speak, they often speak in, in rhyming verse <coughs> even, like super ordered. Uh, and so did the spirits and so forth. And it's just Shakespeare's way of trying to reflect uh, a hierarchy and an ordering. Yes? Um, I was just thinking a doctor at this time kind of is in the in-between. It's not exactly a commoner. He's above most commoners. No, doctor in this, doctor's a teacher, right? It's just right. Docker, docker in Latin is to teach. So I'm Dr. Masson, right? That's because I'm a teacher. It's not because, you know, I mean, I trust you wouldn't trust me with this surgery. So in the sense, I see it as, at the end when he returns to it, it's more of him going, like he starts giving instructions, right? He moves from hers and means of all annoyances. He's moving from just having a conversation to giving instructions as a doctor. Well, he's a doctor of physic, right? right? So it's a certain type and that is I a mean, medical doctor. Giving instruction. Right? right, so he is doing that, but he, he says, and this is back in line 60 or 58, this disease is beyond my practice. Yet I have known those which have walked in their sleep who have died holily in their beds. It, he will go on to say, uh, or it was there somewhere in there that, uh, yes, she has more needs, line 74, the divine than the physician. She needs a priest, not a physician. There's nothing physically wrong with her here there's something wrong with her soul. That's the issue. I do like how the gentlewoman points out that she would not have such a hard time to be a baby being in the whole body. Yes. Like it just shows the corruption of the heart. Corrupts everything yeah, heart here refers more to her moral state, right? Yeah. yeah. Remember, in Shakespeare's age, they don't even have the same understanding of physiology that we do, per se, because they've not actually perform vivisection. They haven't opened up live bodies and that it, that how it would function and all that is not known in the same way. Yes? Line 69, when she says to bed, to bed, there's knocking at the gate. Yeah. Is that a reference to the porter? I think so. It, she seems to be conflating a, a few things, like the original murder of Duncan mm -hmm. is conflated with the murder of Banquo now, mm -hmm. those two deeds. And, and they're sort of interspersed and confused, reflecting the confusion in her mind. Because the porter not only says that um, Macbeth has become Beelzebub, but he also re makes a reference to the other, the other devil, um, which I always took to be Lady Macbeth as the other devil. And hmm. potentially she's saying, oh, I'm, there's more people coming to me. Like more people I haven't thought about that, that he's referring to his wife when he's talking about the other devil. I don't know about that. Could be. Yeah. Well, it's unclear. It's an unclear reference, so it could be that. And again, so there's scope for the actor in that situation to try and suggest that, and there are ways of suggesting it as an actor, then the other devil, and then you do something that suggests you're referring to Lady Macbeth. I don't think he seemed so hostile to her at that point that he would regard her that way. But anyway, it's, it's worth mentioning. So as I said, um, Lady Macbeth and Macbeth have shifted roles by this point in the play. And Macbeth is almost immune to fear and doubt. Remember, he started the play, he, he was famous as a brave man. Brave men are not immune to fear. Brave men um, have mastered their fear, but they're not immune to fear. Otherwise, they wouldn't be brave. You don't praise somebody for uh, something that they never suffer from. It's the fact that he's able to push his fears down to do what he does. That makes him a brave man. He's not brave anymore. He's psychotic. He's a psychopath. 
that's not the same thing, although on the outward surface it may appear the same way. He's going to go into battle and he's going to cut down his enemies. But now it has a different reason. So there's a transfigure, a transformation in the character of Macbeth, and this is part of the tragedy of Macbeth. It's almost the tragedy of Macbeth. What is the tragedy? That he loses his soul. That's the tragedy. A great man, worthy of our esteem, loses his soul. It's a, it is almost a spiritual analysis, the play. And Lady Macbeth is in a sort of an inner hell, and she carries the candle because she's trying to stay in the light because she feels the spiritual darkness closing in. Remember all that I talked about the context of the play being in the dark so often, and now she carries the light around because she's afraid of the dark. Why is she afraid of the dark? Because it's a symbol of something more than the dark. It's the spiritual darkness and everything that comes with it. And she's trying to banish that by carrying the taper. She's at, so there's an imagination of what the dark represents, which has a, a spiritual connotation, I think, for her. And, and, so, and yet she's unable to do it. So what does that mean? She now feels herself cut off from all possible salvation. She can't be saved from this hell. She's banished herself to it. So she, again, is like Macbeth early on when he fears exactly that thing. I've done the deed which I ought not to have done, and now uh, I'm damned. And she's come to the same conclusion. Yes? Um, I was, in my readings, I read someone say that um, Lady Macbeth almost serves as a fourth witch in the sense that she talks about unsightly and that kind of thing, and the witches have beards like men. And well, I suggested something of that sort. I just wouldn't call her a fourth witch, but... But she doesn't seem that reflective. But for the audience, we would draw that conclusion. Her mind's unbalanced. She can't, like sleeping and waking are, they've blurred together. So when she sleeps, she's walking around. And when she's awake, she has nightmares. Like there's no divide anymore. It's a problem. If you have no boundaries in your life, it creates chaos. Try going without sleep for a while. It's not good. It's, it's, it is not good. You need rest. She can't get rest. But more than physical rest, she can get no rest for her soul. That's the, that's the real issue here. And it's being dramatized here. So, uh, and, and that symbolized the futility of her life now is symbolized by the blood which she perceives to be on her hands, which isn't on her hands. There's no blood on her hands, right? But she believes that there is and she can't get it out. Well, no, you can't get it out if there's nothing there, and yet you perceive it to be there. Of course you can't wash it out. And that uh, reflects, again, uh, remember Macbeth had the same thing. After he killed the king, he was covered in blood, and he, he didn't even, he couldn't get it off, he thought. But he didn't even try to get it off, and his wife washed it off. And, oh, it's not a problem. See, it's gone. He said, look, you're clean. And he's like, no, I'm not. But he didn't have these visions of blood. He actually had the blood on his hands at that point. So uh, there's an inner hell that she has descended into. And that inner hell reflects, I submit, that there, she is unable to repent. She's unable to repent or, or to do anything to redeem herself. And she is just lost. And so time for her now is just an endless repetition of the same moment over and over. It's a horror movie. It's like Groundhog Day. Like you just keep going back to that terrible moment and you can't get out of it. It's this endless loop of the same horrible deed and she can't move beyond it. Terrible. So the consequence of her action, she's thinking about the future. Remember, I mean, we talked about this as the, one of the terrible ironies of the, of the play is that Macbeth in doing the deed would become king and yet he would have no um, offspring to pass it on to. So it was this temporary, yes, you're, you're the title of the king, but actually there's going to be no fruits to your labor. You will not enjoy them. In fact, who will? Banquo's son. So he's going to enjoy it. So why would you do it then? 
And so he's tried to stop that consequence by killing Banquo and his son. And that will mean that he stays king, he thinks. It's, right? So they, he, and so he has to keep on killing to try and control the future. Right? So, and this is the thing about murder. You're killing somebody in the present who you have past allegiance to in order to control the future, and yet you lose control of all of those dimensions. He's lost all that. So she has, is stuck in this loop of revisiting the terrible crimes in her own mind, even in her own sleep, whereas for Macbeth, time has stopped insofar as he has, try and, he has tried to uh, anticipate the kingship which would come to him to bring it forward before it was time by murdering the king and as a consequence um, he has trapped himself there's no future for him he's pulled the future into the present and again the boundaries between these things there's a natural course he would have been king according to the witches so, so he was thane of cotter thane of glamis he's going to be king well why not wait around for it how come? Because he didn't do anything to bring about the other. Why wouldn't he just let that happen? He wasn't, the witches didn't tell him to kill the king. His wife did. And he himself thought it immediately. That was his immediate thought. I could take that. So his own selfish desires led him to do the deed, not the witches. And by doing that, he's brought about a fulfillment of, of their prophecy, which is that Banquo's son would be the heirs. So it's really interesting. Yes? So in this case, would Macbeth have had any choice? Like yes, he did. But that was, that's one of the questions in the play, right? Is did, did, he, did the witches actually bewitch him so that he was under their spell and he had no choice? I think the way Shakespeare portrays it, it's clear that um, they had no such power over him. It was his ambition that led him there. But there, it, it's not that it had no influence because it brought the idea to the forefront of his mind. And then when one aspect of the prophecy was fulfilled, he immediately wanted the next to come. And very quickly, he seized the moment. But I, I don't think that he is supernaturally possessed or something like that. And, and, but Shakespeare is commenting to some degree on what Christians talk about when they talk about spiritual warfare and the involvement of spiritual, you know, where is your free will in all of that? Are you not responsible for your actions? Like, are you just compelled? So he is really getting into those issues in a really interesting way. Yes? Yep. Yeah. There's a, a decision, a boundary that's been crossed, and once it's been crossed, right. there's no going back. Right. And it no. seems to lead to other things. Yeah. That's so that's why it's plausible, right? Right. And, and part of it is because the, the reason for which he did it to begin with, to. Um, put himself up in the hierarchy to fulfill his ambition, now he has to do things to ensure that he enjoys the benefits of that. He gets to have the banquet, right? <laughs> right? Let's have the fruits of my success. Let's be, have a social gathering, but he's cut himself off from all society. I mean, it's, it's symbolic, that banquet that he can't enjoy. Uh, anyway. So again, that sense of being caught in the moment then of the terrible deed. And so Macbeth, although he is now no longer constrained by any fear, uh, he is caught in a sort of a spiritual paralysis. He's not able to repent, neither is she. But she is more than spiritually paralyzed. She is uh, psychologically paralyzed, we would say. But note that he feels no torment, remorse, or even pain. As I say, he is a dangerous man.
void of all feeling and uh, mentally and spiritually dead. That doesn't mean that he isn't acting. He is now acting without any reservations. Now, Act 5, Scene 2 is interesting insofar as these are the forces marshalling against Macbeth to try and uh, to lance the boil. So if there's in the kingdom, there has, uh, if there's an abscess and it's grown and it's threatening the whole body and Macbeth is that, they're coming to lance the boil to take, make sure that the problem at the top of the kingdom doesn't destroy the whole kingdom. So the forces are marshalling from outside the country, including a king who has healing in his hands, interestingly. For, so for those who like Lord of the Rings, I mean, this play, the, the, the woods marching in the hands of the healer, and so like it's exceptional stuff. Act 5, Scene 2 are these forces marshalling, and they are commenting on Macbeth. And it's interesting to hear what they have to say. And we learn not from Macbeth himself, but from what others are opining about him, where his, what his spiritual state is. And it, it has, an, I submit to you, a choral effect. It's almost like a, a variety of different speakers. So, uh, Menteth, one of the Scottish lords. So there's Menteth, there's Cathanus, there's Angus, there's Lennox, and there's the soldiers, Menteth. The English power is near, led on by Malcolm, his uncle Seward, and the good Macduff. Revenges burn in them, for their dear causes would to the bleeding and the grim alarm excite the mortified man. Angus. Near burnin' wood shall we well meet them. That way are they coming. Cathnus, who knows if Donalbane be with his brother? For certain, sir, he is not. I have a file of all the gentry. There is Seward's sons, and many unrough youths that even now protest their first of manhood. What does the tyrant, Cathnus? Great Dunsinane he strongly fortifies. Some say he's mad. Others that lesser hate him do call it valiant fury. But for certain he cannot buckle his distempered cause within the belt of rule. That's, that's a telling phrase. So some say this, some say that, some say he's mad, some say that he is valiant in his fury. But the one thing for certain is that he is not in control of himself. He can't buckle his distempered cause within the belt of rule. His stomach is spilling over his pants, his trousers, right? He can't buckle it and his guts are coming out, it, the, the, right? He's not in control of his passions, yes. So you're taking it bro more broadly. It yeah, could, it could. He's not really acting like a ruler. He's pretending to be one, but he isn't really one. I, can't keep it like I think that's possible. Yep. And, and he can't hide his, his character is spilling out. His character is spilling out with that. Yeah. So his passions are spilling out and really his character along with it. Yeah. We, we haven't reached the next, um, the Angus, Angus, what Angus says. Angus, say, so there's a series of comments on it, right? Angus even says, like, he Yep. He says, now does he feel his title hangs about him the giants roll upon Now does he feel his secret murders sticking on his hands? Think of Lady Macbeth and him. Now, now he feels those sticking on his hands. Now minutely revolts upbraid his faith breach. Those he commands move only in command, nothing in love. So it's again like the uh, Sauron his forces move out of fear, not love. They are motivated because they are terrified by the one that's leading them, but not because they actually serve a good thing anymore. They're simply terrified. So there's something about that, and there's something about the forces of fear versus the forces of faith and commitment to and fidelity, and so they're, they're being juxtaposed now. So he really is representing a dark power himself. Yes. Now does he feel his title hang loose about him like a giant's robe upon a dwarfish thief. 
It's a great line. And this is really juxtaposed to how we were showing Duncan as being a loving yes. kind of caring yes. person. And so Absolutely. This, this conversation is a total contrast to the opening conversation that shows the kindness of a ruler versus a tyrant. Here's a good king, here's a tyrant. What's the difference? They both have absolute power. Okay, so that's the same. What's the difference? One rules out of love for those whom he commands. The other out of naked ambition and a, d a willingness to sacrifice anything to satisfy it. But it's the portrait of it's the portrait of a tyrant. But also because of those things, his followers either love him or hate him. Well, his followers don't love him at all. He doesn't have. They all fear him, right. so they're all terrified of him. And so again, uh, Shakespeare here is com commenting on the psychology of of rulers, which goes all the way back to Plato, quite frankly. And, the char and, the, and, and Plato really represents the, the Greek view of the tyrant. It, a tyrant, a tyrannus in Greek is just a, a ruler. And, uh, and it, sometimes it's used of kings as well, but it, it, the denigrated, uh, the sense that it is derogatory rather, is when it, there, people are not doing it to preserve something good like freedom. Where the Athenians, they preserve freedom. They have a sense of freedom. They're fighting for freedom. They're choosing to fight freely. It's will, they're willingly enlisting <coughs> themselves in the army, whereas the Persian army are coerced by the tyrant. They have no will. They, are, they may have a, a host that is far greater than the Athenians or the Greeks, but the Greeks fight freely, willingly, and that is a difference between them. It's, it's there throughout Greek political thought. And here it is presented in this play in a, in a different way and given a spiritual dimension to it. Because the freedom here is the freedom of a, of a covenant. An oath has been given. And the oath is not just binding on their fellow uh, countrymen, but to God as well. So that basic, the, it really is a good versus evil type of uh, struggle being described here. So like a giant's robe upon a dwarfish thief, Amenthes, Amenthes. Who then shall blame his pestered senses to recoil and start when all that is within him does condemn itself for being there? Well, march we on to give obedience where tis truly owed. Meet we the medicine of the sickly wheel and with him pour we in our country's purge each drop of us. So they are going to be like the laxative <laughs> there are the are, are the the washing they will purge there'll be a cathartic purging of the king the kingdom is sick the wheel the commonwealth the sickly wheel we will be the medicine we're going to pour ourselves into that to purge this the uh disease that has overcome the kingdom of scotland as a consequence of this act lennox or so much as it needs to do the sovereign flower and drown the weeds make we our march towards Vernon. So again, this metaphor of gardening, dominion mandate as being at the beginning. What, what is the right rule of uh, vocation to Christian life? It's to tend the garden, whatever the garden is. It's your area of, uh, over which you have some sort of control. You are to do good things there, make sure that, the, that the, the flowers flourish. In this case, the flower will be the sovereign, the future king, the rightful king. Make sure that we do the sovereign flower and drown the weeds. Note that they will be the, almost the same one. One is that you give it a little bit of water. The other is we're going to wash it clean like a, like a flood. That, that metaphor of uh, weeds, we saw that back in, again, um, in Measure for Measure, like an unweeded garden and so forth, right? Uh, Shakespeare uses it all the time. It, it's a potent metaphor. It, it's a biblical metaphor. Anyway, I just love this stuff. But there's this choral effect, and uh, the, this choral effect is a substitute for the audience itself and the audience's opinion. So these various speakers are now speaking for the audience who is surely re repulsed by what they've observed in the character of Macbeth and in his wife, and they want them out. They want the problem solved. Now, it's a tragedy for him but for the audience, there is no sympathy for these figures. They want the bad man gone. And so they, they, these uh, Scottish lords are speaking on behalf of the audience within the play itself. So there's a degenerate kingdom which is going to have to be uh, 
changed. And um, so the rule is compared, as I say, to a garment, the giant's robe, and it doesn't fit him. Whereas Banquo's comment early in the play uh, with it was that Macbeth's honors were bestowed on him are like garments which do not fit him. That's what he said at the outset. So there's a parallel, lots of parallels throughout this play. So again, Macbeth is a tyrant in the classical sense and in the Renaissance sense, he comes to his rule by injustice and he can only use unjust means to maintain it. That's the problem. You can't do one unjust deed to get the power and now enforce just rules and expect it of others. Not possible. Not in any sense possible. So he, and, and he, it's not only unjust, it's unnatural. That's Shakespeare loves to make this metaphor of nature. And he connects justice with nature regularly. It's really prominent in King Lear. He constantly talks about nature there and unnatural, uh, that phrase. So he comes to his throne unnaturally. Should his subjects obey him? Will all of the teaching of the church uh, historically would say absolutely not. They have a duty to rise up against him because he's a tyrant. What about, what about praying for your leaders and praying for those in leadership? I, I see a bit of a juxtaposition in your reference there. Because in Romans it speaks, in 13, it speaks of praying for those in authority for God's place them in their position. Um, Yes, is that, well, there's a huge debate about this hi historically. So this is a, if I can refer you to passages or passages, writers that have discussed this very topic. One of them is John of Salisbury in the 12th century. He wrote a treatise called Polycraticus, which I once wrote an essay on. 12th century, uh, he was commenting on the murder of Thomas A. Becket by King Henry uh, at the time and talking about the conditions under which it would be lawful to depose a tyrant. At what point would the sovereign no longer be a sovereign but rather a tyrant? What would be, at what point would the sovereign be a representation not of God's will but of the opposition to God's will? The very same issues that Christians dealt with in Nazi Germany. Well Hitler's got God ordains all things, Hitler's in place, shall we just submit to his rule? What shall we do here? Well, we should resist passively and we'll pray for him. Okay, and then what are we gonna do? Some will say that's the end of it. We dare not act against the king. Well, there are others that thought otherwise and sought to remove him. As I say, there's a, there's a divide in the Christian tradition on this, but by and large, there's a long standing justification for that and by the time Shakespeare uh, writes uh, uh, not actually not by the time Shakespeare writes shortly thereafter they will they will use that same justification to depose Charles the first arguing that he's a tyrant even though he was the king he was the lawful king but he was a tyrant because he worshiped uh, he worshiped falsely and did all sorts of abominable things persecuting the church etc but then it if you're interested, it, it's a fascinating subject. Um, and, and the Revolutionary Army discussed exactly these things while they were on the battlefield, because this is the lawful king. God has placed him in, or, in authority. And yet we are rising up against him. Why are we doing this? To get him to acknowledge the legitimacy of, and the humanity and the fellow sovereignty of those that are under his care, because it's not just the divine right of kings, Every person who's a, uh, who is a person bears the image of God, and therefore they deserve also some respect. So it's not an absolute, Romans 13 is not an absolute carte blanche for those people who are in authority. There are limits to their power. And the limits uh, are transgressed when they won't repent. That's it. Cause, so that was the argument of this, the, in the Civil War. Charles kept going back on his word. So he, he was defeated in battle. He said, okay, I'll, I'll call, recall parliament. I will, I'll stop doing this. And then he would 
break his word and then you go back and go back to the same thing. And so again and again, eventually they said, we're going to have to, his head goes off because this man is unregenerate. It's impossible. We can't do anything with him. He's a tyrant. Anyway, so you're not arguing with me on this. I'm saying that Shakespeare is articulating a view of deposing the tyrant that is fairly commonly expect, accepted in English thought. There is a point at which you can depose a tyrant. And uh, anyway, so Act uh, 5 uh, is that sort of tyrant. Uh, 5, scene 3, line 55, uh, in Macbeth's description, using the idea of purging to uh, himself, let me, I'll use, go to uh, Macbeth's self-description because he's speaking to the doctor here. Um, Macbeth, the doctor in the attendance. Uh, Macbeth, well, let me be begin it because it's such a famous uh, passage. Bring me no more reports. Let them fly all. Till burning wood removed to Dunsinane, I cannot taint with fear. What's the boy Malcolm? Was he not born of woman? The spirits that know all mortal consequences have pronounced me thus. Fear not, Macbeth, no man that's born of woman shall e'er have power upon thee. Then fly, false thanes, and mingle with the English epicures. The mind I sway by and the heart I bear shall never sag with doubt nor shake with fear. Servant comes in, the devil damn thee, black thou cream-faced loon, what ghost there thou that goose look? There is ten thousand geese, villain. Soldier, sir, go prick thy face and overread thy fear, thou lily-livered boy. Almost the same words that... Lady Macbeth used of him earlier in the play, right? What soldiers, patch, death of thy soul, those linen cheeks of thine are counselors to fear. What soldiers, way face, the English force so please you, take thy face hence. Seaton, I am sick at heart when I behold. Seaton, I say, this push will cheer me ever or deceit me now. I have lived long enough. My way of life is fallen into the sear, the yellow leaf, and that which should accompany old age as honor, love, obedience, troops of friends I must not look to have, but in their stead curses, not loud, but deep, mouth honor, breath, which the poor heart would fain deny and dare not. Seton, Seton comes in. What's your gracious pleasure? What news more? All is confirmed, my lord, which was reported. I'll fight till from my bones my flesh be hacked. Give me my armor. Tis not needed yet. I'll put it on. Send out more horses. Scur the country round. Hang those that talk of fear. Give me mine armor. How does your patient doctor? Not so sick, my lord, as she is troubled with thick coming fancies that keep her from her rest. Cure her of that. Canst thou not minister to a mind diseased, pluck from the memory a rooted sorrow, raise out the written troubles of the brain, and with some sweet oblivious antidote, cleanse the stuffed bosom of that perilous stuff which weighs upon the heart? Therein the patient must minister to himself. <sighs> Throw physic to the dogs, I'll none of it. Come, put mine armor on, give me my staff. Seaton, send out. Doctor, the thanes fly from me. Come, sir, dispatch. If thou couldst, doctor, cast the water of my land, find her disease, and purge it to a sound and pristine health, I would applaud thee to the very echo that should applaud again. Pull it off, I say. What rhubarb, syme, or what purgative drug would scour these English hence? Hearst thou of them? I, my good lord, your royal preparation makes us hear something. <laughs> Bring it after me. I will not be afraid of death and bane till burning forest come to Dunsinane. Out he goes. The doctor, were I from Dunsinane away and clear, prophet again would hardly draw me here. 
everyone wants away from Macbeth because he's mad and dangerous to all. He's going to hang everyone who's afraid. So he's, he's his la lady Macbeth on steroids, right? She was upbraiding him for the cowardice of not being willing to do the deed. Well, now anybody who's in his presence who demonstrates the least bit of fear, the way-faced, goose look, whatever, you hang them, hang them all. Um, and note that he talks about the rhubarb, the syme, or the purgative drug, so the laxative that will purge uh, uh, her of her, her sickness. That's what he speaks of here. The, um, so Macbeth's sickness as king finds an antithetical reference to England, and the English king, who's Edward the Confessor, by the way, uh, has, has healing powers given by God, whereas Macbeth is the exact opposite. And these are described uh, by the doctor in, back in Act 4, scene 3, 141 to 144. Uh, by the way, just for reference sake, King James I also claimed those same healing powers. The hands that he would lay on would heal people of their illnesses. So the English king, which remember now James is the king not only of Scotland, but also of England. It's the United Kingdom. He's King James I of the United Kingdom. He has those same healing hands. So he is represented by, on the one hand, his, his own ancestor, the Scottish ancestor, but on the other hand, the English king, who has the healing powers of his hands. That will restore the problems with the witchcraft and the dissent and the treachery in his ranks. So act, in Act 5, the witch's prophecies have been fulfilled, uh, and they're fulfilled successively. First of all, the Burnin Wood does attack the castle. And say, if you've seen Lord of the Rings and the, the two towers, it, it really is that. It's playing a lot on, on, this, on this play. Uh, secondly, Macduff defeats Macbeth and this great recognition scene. Uh, and if you want to see it in terms of Aristotle's categories of tragedy, there's this great moment of anagnorisis, recognition, when Macbeth realizes that or recognizes that Macduff will defeat him because he was from his mother's womb untimely plucked, plucked wasn't it or something? Yeah. In other words, C-section. He was not of woman born. And again, uh, Tolkien offers a variation on that by uh, presenting it as a female character. Right? No man. I fear no man. Oh, I'm not a man. You know, and, uh, whatever. Fair enough. It, um, so he, um, he's now playing a role, and he recognizes in the, the passage I just said that he's in a, an autumnal state. He talks about the leaf being sear. It's dry. It's yellow. He's come to the end of his reign. He's about to fall. He's prematurely old, and he's prematurely old because he has brought forward time and tried to seek to control the future, which, again, the witch's prophecies also suggest that they had power over. This is one of the reasons why uh, uh, consulting mediums is forbidden in scripture. It's an attempt to bring under your providence and control something that is the Lord's. And if you knew what the future would be, what would you do? There's all sorts of movies that explore that issue. You wish you knew what would happen in the future. Like, who am I going to marry? What are my children going to be like? What am I gonna, what's my vocation? You wish you knew those things. It might be better for you that you don't know those things. Because what would you do at that point to either bring that about or to try and get away from that outcome? Anyway, um, so, but Macbeth is tired of his life and his wife uh, eventually, and we'll come this, to this in uh, scene five, and I'll just read it. We, and now we're in the, the war drums, are, and the colors are being flown. So right in the midst of this, act five, scene five, hang out our banners on the outward walls. The cry is still, they come. Our castle strength will laugh a siege to scorn. Here, let them lie till famine and the egg you eat them up. Were they not forced with those that should be ours, we might have met them dareful, beard to beard, and beat them backward home. 
a cry within of women within the walls of the castle behind him. What is that noise? It is the cry of women, says Seton, my good lord. Macbeth, I have almost forgot the taste of fears. The time has been my senses would have cooled to hear a night shriek, and my fell of hair would at a dismal treat as rouse and stir as life were in it. I have supped full with horrors, direness, familiar to my slaughterous thoughts, cannot once start me. Seton comes back. Wherefore was that cry? The queen, my lord, is dead. Macbeth. She should have died hereafter. There would have been a time for such a word. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle, life's but a walking shadow, a poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. So I don't know how you deliver that line, but he's, his wife's dead and his reflections on it are immediate. So he has no thoughts and now his thoughts are quite profound. In the profundity of the thoughts is that life is meaningless. It's nihilism. There's absolutely no meaning to life whatsoever. Well, there was meaning to life when he was the uh, good thane of Cawdor and Glamis. And once he transgressed the moral boundary and took his king, liege lords, uh, uh, relatives and guests' life, it suddenly lost all meaning. And now that his wife lies, and this wonderful reference again, out, out, brief candle, the candle of a life, she's carrying around the candle, the candle is now extinguished. And there's no Elton John song sing, playing in the background. It's like she's gone and he is broken to some degree here, I think. But that's hard to, hard to know. How do you say those lines? What is, but it, it seems rather more reflective and pensive than what he's been saying up to this point. Like at this point, he's bring him on. And now he's, life is meaningless. Um, and even the language is meaningless. It's a poor player, reflecting on the stage as well. Again, that Renaissance trope of a play within a play. And now life is like a play. And it's a play in which you play a part and that the part has no meaning and the play has no meaning. Uh, in Shakespeare's plays, that's never the case. In modern drama, it's often the case. Like waiting for Godot, you're watching a play about nothing. You're just waiting around for something to happen and nothing happens. There's no meaning to the story. Um, so there's no, he denies value even in the words that he's just spoken. Now a messenger comes in, thou comes to use thy tongue, thy story quickly. Gracious my lord, I should report that which I say I saw, but know not how to do it. Well, say, sir, as I did stand my watch upon the hill, I looked upon Burnin, and anon methought the wood began to move. Liar and slave! Let me endure your wrath, it be not so. Within this three mile may you see it coming. I say, a moving grove. If thou speaks false upon the next tree, shall thou hang alive till famine cling thee. If thy speech be sooth, I care not if thou dost for me as much. I pull in resolution and begin to doubt the equivocation of the fiend that lies like truth. Fear not, now he's quoting, fear not till Burn and Wood do come to Dunsinane. And now a wood comes towards Dunsinane. Arm, arm and out, if this which he avouches does appear, there is nor flying hence nor tarrying here. I begin to be a weary of the sun and wish the estate of the world were now undone. Ring the alarum bell, blow wind, come rack, at least we'll die with harness on our back. 
So he's committed to go down in flames. It's one last charge out, but life is meaningless. It's void. Comes out, Malcolm's uh, uh, Seward Macduff. I'll read Macduff's speech. Make all our trumpets speak, give them all breath, those clamorous harbingers of blood and death. Now note this here, there's a lot, if you ever watch this on the stage, there's a lot of the drum beats and the sounds of the alarms and the speeches are really, are short and so are the scenes. Shift, shift, shift. It's like the theater of war, chaos. Like the scenes, the order is broken down on the stage. There's a lot of shift, 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 shift here, there. Short scenes, um, excited lines chaotic. Scene seven, enter Macbeth. They have tied me to a stake. I cannot fly, but bear like I must fight the course. What's he that was not born of woman? Such a one am I to fear or none. Enter young Seward. What is thy name? Said Seward. Thou'lt be afraid to hear it. No, though thou callst thyself a hotter name than any is in hell. My name's Macbeth. The devil himself could not pronounce a title more hateful to mine ear. No, nor more fearful. Thou liest, abhorred tyrant, with my sword. I'll prove the lie thou speaks. They fight, and young Seward is slain. Macbeth, looking down, probably spitting on him. Thou wast born of woman. But swords I smile at, weapons laugh to scorn, brandished by man that's of a, a woman born. Alarums enter Macduff. That way the noise is. Tyrant, show thy face. If thou beest slain and with no stroke of mine, my wife and children's ghosts will haunt me still. I cannot strike at wretched kerns whose arms are hired to bear their staves. Either thou, Macbeth, or else my sword with an unbattered edge I sheathe again undeeded. There thou shouldst be. So by this great clatter, one of the greatest notes seems breeted. Let me find him fortune, and more I beg not. Out he goes, Malcolm and Seward, Seward come in. This way, my lord, the castle's gently rendered. The tyrant's people on both sides do fight. The noble thanes do bravely in the war. The day almost itself professes yours, and little is to do. We have met with foes, says Malcolm, that strike beside us. Enter, sir, the castle. Now, scene eight, the concluding. Enter Macbeth. Macbeth, why should I play the Roman fool and die on mine own sword? Because now he's sitting around. He, the battle's been lost. What do you do in such a scene except you take your own life rather than give yourself up? to the enemies. Why should I play the Roman fool and, the, and fall on mine own sword? Whilst I see lives, lives rather, the gashes do better upon them. Enter Macduff. Macduff, turn, hellhound, turn. Of all men else, I have avoided thee. But get thee back, my soul is too much charged with blood of thine already. I have no words. My voice is in my sword, thou bloodier villain than terms can give thee out. And they fight. And then they break, exhausted. Macbeth, thou losest labor, as easy mayest thou the entrenchant air with thy keen sword impress, as make me bleed. Let fall thy blade on vulnerable crests. I bear a charmed life, which must not yield to one of woman born. Despair thy charm. Oh gosh, isn't that interesting? Big bunch of stuff. And let the angel whom thou still hast served tell thee Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. A curse be that tongue that tells me so, for it hath cowed my better part of man. My better part of man, what's that? It's courage. It's cowed it. And be these juggling fiends no more believed and palter with us in a double sense that break that keep the word of promise to our ear and break it to our hope. I'll not fight with thee. Then yield thee, coward, and live to be the show and gaze of the time. We'll have thee as our rarer monsters are, painted upon a pole and under it. Here may you see the tyrant. Okay, we'll put you on public display on a post. 
for everyone to mock you. I will not yield to kiss the ground before young Malcolm's feet and to be baited with the rabble's curse. Though burning wood be come to Dunsinane, and thou opposed being of no woman born, yet I will try the last. Before my body I throw my warlike shield, lay on Macduff, and damned be him that cries first, hold enough. And of course, Macbeth is murdered or murdered. He is killed there and in battle. Uh, and then the final scene is the one of restoration. The good King Malcolm rides in with his drums and his colors and his lords, and the, a good king has been restored, one with healing in his hands. And Macbeth's head, which Macduff holds. Look at the head of the traitor. I'm going to put that on a spike somewhere. Macbeth, Macduff, line uh, t uh, 19. Hail, king! For so thou art, behold where stands the usurper's cursed head. The time is free. I see thee compassed with thy kingdom's pearl, that speak my salutation in their minds, whose voices I desire aloud with mine. Hail, King of Scotland, and all. Hail, King of Scotland. Okay, and now the conclusion, Malcolm gets to speak the last words. We shall not spend a large expense of time before we reckon with your several loves and make us even with you. My thanes and kinsmen, henceforth be earls, the first that ever Scotland is such an hour named, in such an hour named. What's more to do, which could be planted newly with the time, as calling home our exiled friends abroad that fled the snares of watchful tyranny, producing forth the cruel ministers of this dead butcher and his fiend-like queen, who, as tis thought, by self and violent hands took off her life. This, and what needful else, that calls upon us, by the grace of grace, we will perform in measure, time, and place. So thanks to all at once, and to each one whom we invite to see us crowned at Scone. concludes with a rhyme it's very tight tight it's the order there's the order the beauty the harmony the goodness all of those things order has been restored it's a tragedy but it's not a tragedy in the classical sense it's a it's a tragedy in the christian sense a restoration of order right rule of justice etc uh, with the traitor macbeth dead so anyway end of the play thank you we'll see you next time and we are